When we started out with Uriah Heep, all we had really was a ton of enthusiasm, a, a, a great deal of determination. Uh, none of us really knew much about what lay ahead of us. I mean, we didn't really think too much about it, except that we knew we wanted to make a noise and we wanted it to be a noise that lots of people would like and uh, we wanted to sell lots of records, but we didn't really know how to go about it. All we knew what to do in those days was how to make loud rock and roll music. Everything's a rock and roller, isn't it? This one's called So, so Tired. One, two, I want to do that. <laughs> happened was I, I received a call from Paul Newton who was the bass player with Uriah Heep at the time and who had worked with me with Spice at the time and who had worked with me in in the gods for a period and he said that the group was getting ready to go in the studio had uh, got together with Jerry Braun who was managing the group at the time and uh, they were considering adding keyboards to the lineup it was just a four-piece group at the time and um, I went along and I met the band and I met Jerry and we discussed you know, various ambitions and plans. Listened to some of the stuff which they had recorded, and it, it I was tr you know, tremendously interested in it because the music was different. It was very energetic, but it was different. And um, the end result was we, we started to rehearse together, and uh, the whole thing became so exciting that it, Jerry decided to rename the whole thing and give it a completely new identity from the start. That was Jerry's idea. Yeah, the name was Jerry's idea. As I recollect, 
Um, people often ask me, uh, even now in interviews, uh, about the name. Of course, it, it originates from David Copperfield, a book by Charles Dickens. And to my recollection, 1970 was the, the year that everybody celebrated the fact he'd been dead for 100 years, which is, I still don't know why they celebrate somebody being dead for a long time. But, and so his name was on bus, sides of buses, and all his plays and everything were being shown on TV and in the theatre. And I think Jerry just came out to Hanwell, where we were practising one day, and said, I got an idea for the name of the group. I saw it on TV last night. We're going to call, what about calling it Uriah Heep? And I can clearly remember everybody going, yeah, that sounds great, and just getting on with the music. Take me across the world, cause I need some place to hide. I don't the red just out and I showed it hurt us. Nothing 
an album in true Uriah Heep vein was called Very Heavy, Very Humble. <laughs> Did that in any way reflect your attitude at the time? Well, it was a little bit of a pun, yeah. Uh, very Humble was what Uriah Heep, the accountant, used to always use as his um, conciliatory attitude in the, in the book, of course. But, um, you know, the band was considered a heavy rock band in those days, you know. I mean, uh, we got labelled all kinds of other things after that, some of which we can't repeat, <laughs> they're not printable. But the thing was that it was the early days of people needing to find a category and a label and a description for something. So we were called a heavy rock band and we didn't mind that, we quite liked that because we were very intense about what we did and uh, you only have to watch some of the early film footage to see that the band was very, very uh, active and very energetic. <laughs> We said we'd do something for you at the end of the show that was just for you. We'd like to thank each and every one of you for coming and taking the time out to visit us in Shepparton because we really appreciate it. And we're going to do this old nostalgic song from around about 1957, which is dedicated to every one of you. And it starts with a new. Oh, 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 oh,
a day at all. Tell Chikaska about this one. Come on. One for the money, two for the show. You get a better nap, but you get a better nap. You step up and say, gee. You can do anything, but lay out the bubble and say, gee. You can burn up my house, you can step in my face. Put my booze all over the place. Do anything you want to do. relationship musically and personally between myself, Mick and David uh, developed very quickly. It, it was uh, one of those, that was spontaneous. Um, and the three of us became the nucleus of the band. Uh, Paul was very solid, Paul Newton the bass player was very solid to begin with, but Alex Napier, our first drummer, who was a, a jolly nice guy and, and a capable drummer whose problems wouldn't show up in a live date, became very obvious, these same problems became very obvious in the studio, and he was the first person to be replaced. Nigel Olsen came along, he was very transient and had obviously higher aspirations musically, and um, he came along primarily because David Byron was friendly with Elton John at that stage, who introduced him to Nigel. And Nigel was a very good drummer, um, but you never got the feeling that he was a permanent member of the band, none of us. So by this time, we were increasingly becoming a three-piece band, David, Mick and myself, looking to fill those other spaces in, in, with much the same relationship as the three of us had. So we went through a lot of drummers and, until we persuaded Lee Kerslake to join the band. This is about the time Look At Yourself uh, came along. And uh, that was our third album. So we were well into our recording career by the time we actually stabilised the line-up of the band, but that we, we were searching, we were just looking. We were looking for people that were musically and personally compatible with the three of us. And um, Gary Thane joined the band 
And this then, Gary and Lee, when they joined, provided the group with that missing link, which carried it from being a, um, a novice group into becoming a very experienced group that had a much clearer idea of what it wanted to do as a group. We then had five people in the band whose collective energy provided it with the momentum to achieve all these things that now needed to be achieved. And it's significant, I think, that from the time Lee and Gary joined the band, that was the time the group took off in America. If you're looking for a place you can fly together And you're really afraid of what you're leaving behind Take the easiest road, but take care, my brother For you'll never find peace with a troubled mind It's far better to love each other than to worry so deep Front man. David was the communication point, the focal point of the whole group's on-stage operation, and he was great at it. He had so much charisma, so much ability. He didn't have the world's best voice, but he was one of the very first. Him and Rod Stewart, you know, he was always a couple steps behind Rod, which I think drove David crazy. You know, he was always a week behind going to the same tailor that Rod used to go to, because by the time David would get there, Rod's gone to another tailor, you know, so following him around like that. But um, I think that being, being in his position, and I certainly wouldn't have wanted that responsibility, I, I think that uh, David felt more responsibility than he actually had. And consequently, if he got nervous or something, his reaction to it was to have a few extra drinks. And um, I don't know how else to put it nicely. I, I don't know what I would do in that situation, so it's really hard for me to comment. I just know one thing, that, and that is that David's drinking really started to separate him from the rest of the band because unfortunately it was a little bit hard to swallow watching somebody uh, throwing away his career and potentially yours too and uh, it was unanimously decided that he was going to be removed from the band, he was going to be replaced. That was in just before summer of 76. Was there a great deal of bad feeling? Was he very bitter about this decision? Um, he, I spoke to him last September and you know we've talked about it. He felt that uh, we were wrong, um, which is natural for somebody with the amount of pride that David had. And um, you could all, you could talk about it till you're blue in the face. There was a lot of animosity. There was a great deal of animosity. I mean, it's always advertised in the press as an amiable split, and I'd like to see an amiable you know, split. It's like calling somebody a good loser. I don't know what a good loser is. Somebody has to show me a good loser, and I'll show you a pussy. I mean, that's ridiculous. But anyway, uh, the bottom line is, yeah, there was a lot of animosity. There was a lot of people that didn't uh, didn't didn't like David and David didn't like a lot of people and uh, we all just felt off we were better apart you know so we didn't talk to each other for a long time after that. Well you replaced David with John Lawton mm -hmm. who was uh, with a German bass band Lucifer's friend why John Lawton particularly? He was recommended Roger Glover recommended him to me uh, um, they had he had worked with John in the butterfly ball, that thing that they did with uh, Glenn Hughes and Ian Gillen. And uh, we heard some of the stuff that he had sung, and he clearly had a phenomenal voice. And uh, he came to the band knowing most of the songs already. And uh, I mean, he had a voice. If you closed your eyes and ignored the fact that, you know, he didn't have some of the um, image attributes, if to put it kindly, um, he had a voice that I thought and I think everybody agreed, would give the band uh, a new dimension and, and possibly have some future in it. And that was the reason for choosing him.
John Lawton, who had never basically worked out, I believe, left and was replaced by ex Lone Star vocalist John Sloman. Mm -hmm. um, now, John gave the band something slightly different, didn't he? I mean, yeah. he was very much a uh, front man's front man, if you like. He was good yeah. looking, hair, you know, yeah. appealed to the little girls, I would imagine, tremendously. I mean, how did that change the band? For, much for the worse. <laughs> my honest opinion. I mean, I'll tell you like it is, I thought that was a tragic era. Yeah. I was uh, strenuously opposed, and this is nothing against John, because he's a very talented guy, but in terms of being appropriate for Uriah Heep, he was 180 degrees off base as far as I was concerned.
Golby in the band who we auditioned at the same time and everybody else didn't and kind of ironic that Pete Golby is now the lead singer for Uriah Heep and I quite certainly know that if the band had chosen Pete Golby I would have been uh, still in Uriah Heep now because I think Pete gave the band the front, the vocal and personal identity that the band needed. We'd like to go back 10 years for this next tune. We'd like to play a track from the Demons and Wizards album. This is especially for the people that are here tonight in Auckland. This is called The Wizard.
Thank you. That's a new single. At this point in the show, I would like to introduce you to the guy that formed Uriah Heep in 1969. Auckland, say hello to Big Box. I think, I think it's fair to say that you've got a lot of friends here today. Go say hello.
energy, a sense of humour, and uh, to some to some degree a sense of reality, which which was stabilising at times. He was always good at interviews. Um, he was always very pleasant to people. Never had a bad word to say to or about anybody uh, at the important times. I mean, and he was always very dedicated. Mick was always punctual. He had all the ingredients of being a great band member and. Quite, of, quite definitely the band wouldn't have done what it did without him. Um, I hope he keeps playing for years and years and years and that he's always happy.
It's called Too Scared, and you'll understand what this is all about. Too Scared to Run. <laughs> to say goodbye to something that had meant so much to us for so so long and we would always hang on to the lamest excuse the slightest little reason to keep it going 
we'd keep it going. Just one more album. You know, we'd just get down on our dumps, and then we'd have a hit in Germany. We'd go, well, let's do another album and another tour, you know. Yeah. But after a while, it becomes like drudgery. And I got into the music business because I like music. And uh, I loved the money and everything else and all of that. But it seems to me, in retrospect, that all it brought was a lot more trouble than it was worth. I now don't have any money, but I'm happier than I've ever been because I got my music right. And if David Byron and Gary Thane were still alive, um, we might do what Deep Purple just did. You want some easy living? Yeah. 